What is up everybody? Welcome to this video. So, elephant in the room. The world is going bat crazy right now. If you guys are watching this in the future, it is March of 2020 right now. So I just felt it would be appropriate to leave a little note in here about that and just kind of let you guys know what my plan is for the next few months and wish you the best wherever you are in the world. As for me, I'm gonna be hunkering down in Colorado for now, just working on edits, working on pumping out a bunch of new content for this channel, and just prepping for when things get back to normal. I have absolutely no idea when that will actually be, but things will get better. And if there are any positives to be taken from this entire situation, maybe this is just a really good opportunity to reconnect with the people and things that you might have lost touch with in this super fast-paced world that we live in. So I wish you guys all the best, and and let's hop into this video. In this video, I'm gonna be sitting down with my good friend, Robbie Snader, who is the head of video and media strategy at Movement. If you're unfamiliar with Movement, it is an LA-based watch company started by two college dropouts in 2013, and in 2018 was actually acquired by Movado for $100 million. As some of you might know, I run an online school for content creators called Creator Academy. And a massive part of building a freelance videography business is working closely with brands and companies. So hearing things from Robbie's perspective about that side of the world was really enlightening. He also recently branched out to do more freelance based videography work. So he also can speak about that side of things as well. And overall, it was just a really interesting conversation and I really enjoyed talking to him. If you wanna to listen to the entire conversation, you can find it inside Creator Academy, which is linked below. But past that, without further ado, here is Robbie Snader. All right, guys, so welcome to this video where I'm sitting down with Robbie Snader, who is the head of video and content strategy at Movement. And we're just going to be sitting down, having a super casual conversation, just asking him about his background and all that kind of goes into your job. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Excited to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me, man. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, so I guess first off, like, what's your story? How did you kind of like get involved with movement? What exactly is your job? Just kind of like, yeah, your backstory. Yeah, absolutely. So I was working at a restaurant my sophomore year of college uh, as a host. I wasn't even a server. It was just like super college job, make a quick buck here and there. And a group of guys, random guys, walked into the off, uh, into the restaurant. I seat them at a booth, and as I'm leaving, one of the guys kind of looks at me, he's like, hey man, I like your watch, what watch is that? And it wasn't a movement watch, they were like brand new at the time, I was wearing some random company, I can't even remember what it was, and I looked at the guy, I was like, oh, this thing, like, it sucks, I hate it, it's not that good of a watch, blah, blah, blah. I was like, but, I was like, my girlfriend, she just bought me a MVNMT, like, I didn't even know the name of it, it was so new. I was like, she just bought me this, like, m m movement watch or something. And one of the guys at the table looks at me and he's like, hey, man, I'm Jake Cass and I own movement watches. And I was like, no way. So, like, serendipitously <laughs> enough, I had said the right thing to the right person at the right time. Um, Jake was super cool, like, in the entire table was essentially everyone at the company at that point in time. There were like four or five people there. Like, what year was this? This was probably like 2014 at some point in time. They were probably around for like maybe like eight months to a year, give or take. Um, still super like bootstrap, grassroots, like, everyone who was working at Movement at the time was like friends of friends or roommates or like childhood best friends or whatever it was. So. I was kind of this like outlier who was the first person out in the wild who didn't really know the guys personally um, to like be an advocate and fan of the brand. Jake tells this story too, like he's done hundreds of panels and speaking engagements since like being acquired and this uh, everything else. Um, and Jake always tells this story where he's like, Robbie was the first person to like know about her brand and talk about it. It's kind of this cool little thing that I now get to share. Uh, but yeah, me being opportunistic, I, uh, Jake asked for my email to send, he was going to send me a free watch and that was going to be the end of it. And I emailed him back, I'm like, hey man, I'm a huge fan of the brand, like would love to like, I know I'm just some kid, but would love to work for you one day, like let me know. Was, my mindset was really just give me a broom and I'll sweep the floor better than anyone else. You know, I just wanted, I just wanted in because I knew once I had an in and I can flourish and do my thing and kind of prove myself, um, I would be a-okay for the time after so he was really cool he was trying to get me in the door uh he had asked me to like 
drop out of school, come in full time, like do all this stuff. And ironically enough, they're college dropouts who sold their business for a hundred million dollars. And I told him, I was like, dude, I can't drop out of college. Like my mom will murder me. I just can't. <laughs> so stuck it out, stayed in school. We stayed in touch for a couple of years. It was like not being annoying, but being persistent. I would check in every couple months, like, Hey man, hope you're doing well. Merry Christmas, whatever I'd have to do to just kind of be back on his radar. And then eventually uh, I got to a point where I was just about to graduate my senior year and Jake hit me up. He's like, hey, we have a part-time job. If you want to come in to apply? I was like, absolutely, sign me up. And had like a few interviews for my role. And Emmy and Spence and Blake were like the dream team to kind of rally behind me. Um, Emmy in particular, shout out Emmy. She definitely rallied for me. So yeah, it's cool. I've been there, been there for three years now. So it's kind of like this weird story where it was like right place right time right everything but i mean if i sucked on my job i also wouldn't be here three years later so that's kind of encouraging to know that yeah i kind of fit the bill to some degree right so what was your first role when you were there like when you first got hired on yeah the so i got hired on essentially as emmy's assistant I and mean, he was the social media coordinator okay um i got hired on as a social media assistant so it was really just helping out with like instagram stories curating the feed with her captioning posts just anything that was like outward facing to a customer of like the movement brand DNA and what that looked like and how do we market ourselves best. Um, that was my role for probably about eight months. It was like just a grind, dude. Like every day was answering DMs, customer side, customer service side of things, like a million, a million little kind of the, the crap work that you don't want to do, but you just have to do. And then um, eventually I moved from part-time to full-time. I remember I was telling Jake, like my college graduation was like a Tuesday and they moved me part-time like Wednesday or Thursday. Like it was like, I was just ready to hit the ground running and they were really cool about it. Like wanted me to be there full-time and move up. So once I was full-time, I then got promoted to a social media coordinator, which was essentially Emmy's counterpart. So she tackled most things like movement for her. I tackled most things movement. Her and I kind of, two people running a channel with like millions of followers. It's kind of wild to think that like what we do, so many people yeah. see and like take it. It's, it's really cool. So got moved up to her counterpart. And then recently, um, end of 2019 was moved to video and media strategy, which was kind of doing more like campaign side of things. So like, how do we start from like inception to execution? What does that look like for us to, do something with an influencer or do a bigger commercial or like um, all these little things. And obviously we outsource a ton of content, yourself included. Like I have hired you for stuff, right? Like we outsource a ton of really cool stuff from crazy talented people like Jeremiah, um, that one blonde kid on Instagram. He shot our most recent movement commercial, absolutely crushed it for us. Um, but just to like kind of be involved and like bounce ideas back and forth between like Blake and Spencer who really are like the brains of the whole operation and like credit where credit's due, they're incredibly talented guys. Um, it's really cool just be in the same room and like have those conversations and open up a dialogue around like, wow, I get to sit at work and like talk about like a movement commercial or like what our big new campaign is for like this watch that we're about to drop. Like, you know, it's it's really fascinating. When, the, when your most recent uh, commercial like was airing, I'd be like in a bar with friends or something and look up at ESPN and it's like, oh, shit, it's a movie commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah I still to this day get DMs, like text DMs all the time. We're like, your commercial's playing. Like, yeah. It's, it's kind of wild. You guys did such a good job about the branding and just like have, getting the right people to be posting about movement and creating the content. Um, like more so than really any other brand that I've ever seen. Um, how did you guys initially kind of get into that or like, cause in influencer marketing wasn't really a yeah. thing as much back then. And you guys were like kind of the first people that I really saw doing it. Yeah. So I'm going to play more of a messenger role just because I wasn't really there in those like early, early days. Um, however, like knowing all the guys and being as close as we all are, like I've heard the story a million times, but it really came down to like, Blake, Spence, Alex, Jake, like everyone just being super scrappy and growth hacky and reaching out to whoever they could whenever, like at any hour of the morning or night or whenever, they would just DM a million people like, hey, we love seeing free product. We love seeing free product. Can you please take our walk? Like just do anything where they can get product on their customer's hand because 
their philosophy was essentially if these people got a movement watch, we know that they're going to fall in love with it and therefore will promote us. That can maybe turn into a paid promotion or whatever, but basically like word of mouth marketing was super important back in the day. They were just trying to gift everyone products. Um, to your point, like influencer marketing was like right place, right time, right? Like every, like it was a perfect storm of knowing where to spend dollars smart and the team behind who's spending the dollars and taking the time to kind of like coordinate everything, right? So um, Blake and Spence really like spearheaded a lot of that stuff in the early days. And then now I've kind of transitioned into like, we have a huge team. When I got hired, I was probably, I think I was an employee number like 21, 22. We're at like 50 now in the office, which is crazy. And we still have more people that work for us and we source like specific needs from that are in other countries. And like, it's pretty wild. So um, that was a lot of just like, when I say like manual work, it was literally just cold DMing a thousand people and hoping that 10 responded, you know? And then out of those 10, hoping that eight of them didn't just steal your product and never hear from you again, but I actually post, you know? Yeah. And then, then engaging like, who's getting good engagement, who's gonna be a personality and an advocate and a voice for us and like, and be a brand fit essentially. Cause like anyone we work with, uh, whether it's content creators, influencers, whatever, they're still like, I wouldn't say it's rigorous, but there's still like a threshold that you have to like maintain to work with us, right? And that's not to like put movement on a pedestal or anything. It's like, we just want to work with people that excite us because it's a symbiotic relationship where we want them to feel like they're promoting a brand that they really believe in and we want to rally behind them to their audience and have them engage, you know? So yeah, it's kind of a full circle, but definitely in the early days, to answer your question, was just like there was no easy way. There was literally no easy way. It was just a team of people doing manual DMs over and over, a thousand a day or whatever it was. And I don't, honestly, I don't know if that would even be possible in today's playing field with just how the Instagram algorithm is and like so many things have shifted. And just, I mean, when I really say like movement's a unicorn, and I talk to my friends about this, like, right place, right time, right CPMs, right everything for like, uh, and obviously credit where it's not all luck, like Jake definitely made really smart decisions early on from like, even if it's as simple as like, do we dive deep into Snapchat ads or do we do Facebook? And like, Facebook's now worth like $700 billion and Snapchat's worth like 20. So it's like, you know, it's like as all these other big players in the same space grew, we grew and we made the right decisions to grow. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's so cool. Like you say that cause, uh, like a big thing that we talk about in creator Academy is just from the, the content creator side, like photographer, videography side, like yeah, yeah. you have to send like a million emails and yeah. it's a grind and you send a hundred and then you get like five back that say no. And you're like stoked about it. You're like, Oh shit, they responded. Like, <laughs> yeah. At least they got a response. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's, it's so cool hearing from the other side of things, like the brand side, when you guys had to reach out to people and reach out to people and reach out to people. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just about persistence and like, it takes so much time and effort, but it pays off in the end. Yeah. And, and it's so funny you saying that too. Uh, talk about persistency. Like I get, 150 emails a day that are just like cold emails or people find my LinkedIn and they just kind of assume my email is this, which it probably, you know, like they yeah. find out somewhere or another, but I get so many emails a day and like, I really just like, if I'm being blunt, I just delete like 99% of them. And the people that always are the ones that can hop on a call with me for 10 minutes or I get an email back out to them or like almost nine times out of 10, if you reach out and you keep reaching out, I respect that hustle and I'm like, all right, this guy's worth a 10 minute phone call. That's crazy, like 150 a day? Oh yeah, I, yeah. If I, if I'm, and like right now today's a holiday, we're on President's Day on Monday and like I'll probably have a couple hundred emails tomorrow like sit there. But it's like, you think it's cool, like it's so funny, like when I was younger, I was like, I wanna be like adulting and be in meetings and answer emails and have a big boy job. And it's like, dude, I just wanna film. Like I just wanna make yeah. Facebook, like I just wanna make cool movement videos. Like yeah. I don't care about being, like yeah, the memes are great here and there, but like, just don't answer emails, don't like, yeah. don't want to do anything else. Like I know what I'm passionate about, I know what gets me fired up. And like, of course all the other stuff comes with 
like your responsibilities and your role uh, within a company, and especially as like a team player within a bigger organization. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it, it's so mentally just like I just like already like when I'm open up my emails, I'm like ugh. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, but that's not to say that like there are the few people that kind of get through the cracks, right. and some of those people like I'm super stoked that I even took the time to like, I'm glad that they were persistent enough to like keep reaching out and I'm glad that I took the time to actually follow up because a lot of those people that I otherwise would have written off or just not responded to, they've turned into like some of my best content creators that I source content from for movement. So in addition to um, when people reach out to you, in addition to just that persistence, like just sending email, 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 is there any certain things that you look for, um, like specifically when someone reaches out to you? Like, a lot of people think that they need, like, a shitload of followers to, like, just work with any company, um, but what we always, like, focus on is just content. Like, content is so important. Um, obviously, followers and, like, how much exposure you can give matters, but how much does that specifically come into play when you're looking for people to work with? I guess it depends on what type of project, whether you're looking for content or promotion yeah um great question a lot of it for me specifically i don't care if you have a million followers or 500 followers like actions speak louder than words or in this case like if your portfolio or your video work or your photography is incredible i i'm not going to look further than that you know like it speaks for itself um i will say i do like doing test shoots with people even with that said it gives me a little bit of leverage to one, not like break the bank on a first shoot with someone and be like, here's all of my marketing budget for the month. Like, no, uh, like I want to, I want to get you paid. Sure. I like you as a person. I want to work with you. But like, no. Um, so I do want to do test shoots with people. It also does a few things when I do that. It lets me kind of build a relationship with that person over like, let's say we have email correspondence or we're shooting each other text or a phone call or whatever. And like going through a test shoot, uh, when we get that back, I can kind of like either steer the ship in a lot of different directions, give them constructive feedback, make it better, give them feedback that's incredible and work, start working with them, not work with them at all. So it gives me a little bit more leverage than just being like, I like your photos, here's a thousand dollars, please take more. And then they come back and they're bad. And then I'm like out of thousand, or movement's out of thousand dollars, you know, and that's not a good way to spend money. So um, I do respect when people send over like pitch decks because it shows to me that they took the time to do a little bit of their homework and like maybe they, it could be as simple as like they looked at Movement's Instagram and then they uh, kind of found like the vibe or the brand voice or whatever they're looking for and they honed it in because I hate when I get like, you can tell when you get the pitch deck that's like a PowerPoint presentation of like, we want to go to Tulum and all they do is like change the brand like hey movement like instead of <laughs> hey Pure Vita it's hey movement it's like dude we're not going to send you Tulum we're not going to send you to Tulum either like Pure Vita didn't we don't because like it's just like a candid you know like thing it's like take a little bit more energy effort and time into it what I was going to say is uh, Evan Paterakis he's a great example and I don't know if you've met Evan or he's a really good friend you know Evan yeah, yeah he, dude he's incredible dude and I'll never forget we get a thousand DMs a day from people that are like Hey, send me a watch. I want to work with you. Send me a watch. Send me a watch. Like, you guys don't see a movement saying, send me a watch. I, I will not respond to you. Don't care. Like, it's the most frustrating thing. What I will say, what Evan did, and what I totally commend him for, and like respect the hell out of him for, he sent an email saying, Hey, I bought a watch. I made this video with my buddy. Let me know what you think. Like, that black and white, no shade to gray. It was very much like, I took the time to do what I think I'm good at, which is making video. Let me know if you guys want more of this. And we watched the video, uh, it was, I think it was called Sleepless in New York City. It's still on Movement's YouTube channel. Incredible, like, uh, like incredible. I was so blown away. Um, the kid was super young. I think Evan's like a couple years younger than me and I'm 25. So yeah. it just blew me away. And I was like, this is exactly the type of person and the type of person that has the work ethic that I would want to rally behind. and like. I can probably guarantee you if Evan hadn't sent that to us and it wasn't on Blake's radar, my radar, Spencer's radar, like he would not have done half the things that he's done today. And for those who aren't familiar with Evan's work, like 
He's shot Justin Bieber's stuff. He's yeah. really good friends with Rory and Como. He's living with Jeremiah, who's like one of our biggest cinematographer DP guys who's shot our commercials. Like his whole world 180 just by being like, hey, I'm gonna take a flyer on this and send movement a video. And like, like you know, like that's the kind of like work ethic and tenacity that I love to see. Yeah, that's actually an example I was gonna ask you about. Yeah. Because um, it's such a perfect example. Yeah. Of like, like he literally just bought a watch and was like, okay, I'm gonna make this video. I'm gonna put all this time into this piece of content. And I have no idea if I'm gonna get monetary returns. Like, yeah. you could have just done it to the email. You could have just like, oh, this is just another one. Exactly. I'm sure he would have sent another email. But yeah, yeah. It could have just not been seen. And yeah, like he just put all this work in worked for free and it's led Literally. to so much stuff for him. And which, is, and which is not to say that other people haven't done the same thing, but I then just did a little bit better. You know, like people have to be able to be like, hey man, check out this video. And like, I'm like, love the effort. Just not there. Like something misses the mark or like, I don't need to work with you. Like I'm stoked that you're a fan of the brand and like love movement. And like, I'm happy to send you another free watch just for you taking the time to like make a video. I think that's really cool. Um, but Evan, Evan just like blew us out of the water and like his, I mean, his network and his friends and stuff now, like definitely show, show for his work. Like, yeah, it's cool. He shot Justin Bieber's wedding, by the way. <laughs> Evan definitely shot Justin Bieber's wedding. Yeah. Yes. And he's just the nicest guy in the world. He's so quiet. I love the kid. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> you never know he's there, but he's, when he speaks, you're like, you, thank you for saying that. Yes. hundred percent. Once he, once he gets out of his comfort zone, uh, yeah, like, he's, the best. he's hilarious. Yeah. We road tripped out from, uh, he came from Baltimore out here and I'll never forget, like just at least once a day, he would just stick his head out the window and just yell road trip. <laughs> like, once he gets out of his I love mind. that. I literally love that. I remember when uh, you had reached out, didn't know you, I was like always on a network, meeting people, saw your Instagram, knew you were a crazy talented drone operator and wanted to like hear your story and everything. So I was like, yeah, let's link up, let's get lunch. Got lunch, became fast friends, worked together like probably within the next like month. I knew you were going to Mongolia and I was like, that's such a cool opportunity for us to do something. So in addition to all the stuff that you do um, with movement, you do a lot of freelance stuff for other companies. Um, just from the yeah. experience that you have, doing the stuff you've done for, for movement, you kind of branched off into the freelance world and started doing that for other companies, right? Yeah, and what's so cool about working at movement and being able to do that is, like Jake especially, he's the nicest guy in the world, most humble, coolest dude. Jake's our uh, CEO and co-founder, or now president since we got acquired, but um, I remember having this conversation with him where I walked into his office one day and said, Hey man, like, I just want to do my own thing on the side. I know I can make a little extra buck here and there. And it was going to, I knew it was going to be lucrative just be, from talking of, to friends of mine who did freelance videography and maybe fortunately, but also maybe unfortunately enough, I learned so much of the do's and don'ts from movement, like all the mistakes I'd made through movement. I knew what not to do for any other brand I had worked with, like or moving forward. Uh, so that was a really unique experience. Where the moment I, the moment I like split the switch in my head to be like, all right, I'm gonna go do freelance stuff on the side, and this really was like a weekend hustle. Uh, get home at six p.m. from work and do editing from like you know like get home from gym or get home from work, go to the gym, eat dinner, and edit from like ten to two in the morning wake up, go to work all day, you know, really was that grind for a long time. I don't really remember how it all kind of like started to snowball, but fortunately I've never really sent any cold DMs. Like ironically enough, all the people that send me cold DMs to work for movement, I've never really done that for other brands because it's all networking and my friends are friends. And we're in such a unique situation where we have a ton of mutual friends and a lot of our friends are entrepreneurs and they've started their own brands and they're all in desperate need of video content or DR marketing ad, direct response ads that are like all the ads you see that you get targeted digitally that are like learn more, swipe up, click here, buy now. All that is like what I thrive in. That's my language that I speak is how do we tell a story? How do we sell a product? How do we get people interested in whatever it is that you're promoting in five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, because people's attention spans are so quick nowadays that no one wants to sit around and watch 
a, even a 30 second traditional commercial to be on TV, unless you're watching a Super Bowl, no one cares. Like if you can't tell me your product in eight seconds, I don't care. And wiring my brain to do that for movement really helped me thrive doing freelance videography work. One of my, one of my first clients, I got hooked up because my buddy Taylor Offer, who owns Feet Socks, I don't know if you know Taylor or not. I think we met at Lucas's house once. Yeah, time. super good dude. Uh, like the king of networking. It's so weird. I'll talk to any random stranger that's like a friend of a friend. He's like, oh, you know Taylor too? I'm like, how does everyone know Taylor? Right? <laughs> Taylor got me in contact with this guy, Brian Spunt, who is another entrepreneur. He was the head of uh, like e-com for a, co- a clothing company called Elwood. A uh, big like fashion streetwear brand. And Taylor was like, Brian, Robbie, Robbie, Brian, Brian, you need a video. Robbie's going to make your video make it happen and like the very next day or day after that we met up and the concept that he had was this video where it's basically a tracking shot moving camera right to left and as he was walking on the beat of the music his whole outfit was going to change so it was like on the snap of like a step it's like your framing doesn't change so the subject's right where it's going to be and you're just sliding so the background changes like a graffiti wall to a fence to a park like whatever it is but it's like a different outfit so it's like really to promote his clothing brand like, look at all that look at all the fits you can get for what it was like 14 dollars, like whatever so i had never i didn't own a ronin never operated a ronin which is a steady cam it's like a motorized gimbal I, all i had was a glide cam hd 2000 i was like there's no way i can accomplish what i know i need to accomplish on a glide cam because i just don't have a steady like steady enough like I to really get it dialed in perfectly. It's hard. It's really damn it's hard. It's really hard. So I remember the day before that big shoot, and this was like my first like couple thousand dollars to go shoot like a Facebook ad for, for a client who I hadn't even met yet. Now Brian and I are really good friends, but I remember the day before I went to Sammy's camera, I rented a Ronin M. I spent like eight hours on YouTube learning how to like stabilize, balance it. I took that thing out of the box, put my camera on it, stabilized it, disassembled it, rinse and repeat. I did that probably like 20 times until I was like, I got this. I'm not going to look like an idiot in front of this guy tomorrow. Got no sleep. Woke up the next day, showed up on set. On set, it was set is me and Brian literally walking around <laughs> DTLA. And uh, I pull out the Ronin M from the box that I rented from Sammy's camera. He thought I owned it. I looked super professional, legit. I balanced my camera in two seconds because I just learned how to do it 12 hours ago. And we shot that whole ad and it's like, it's, I'll send you the ad or if you have cliff notes or something, you can post it, but it turned out great. And he turned into like a month, like, and then a lot of clients will then throw me on a monthly retainer where I can then work with them. And it's kind of just like fun to have comfortability knowing that I have people that have set deliverables. So they know exactly what they're expecting to get from me. And I know what they need. And then like the more you work with a brand or anyone, you just, you build that personal rapport, you know what the brand's voice is a little bit better. So with movement, obviously with movement, like I'm dialed in, like I know the do's and don'ts, I know what works, I know what's going to sell a watch. With all these other brands, it's a learning process every single time. It's a new product, new category, whatever it is. Just a lot of little details and, and there's really no other, it sounds so cliche, but there's really no way to become good at anything without just trying. So my advice is like, with freelance stuff and just flipped the switch one day where I was like, I'm going to do this. And like within a week I was doing it. And then from Elwood, I've worked with Cuts Clothing. I've worked with Liquid IV. I've worked with a thousand brands that I love and have all become friends with all the people at those companies. So it's been cool. Yeah. That's so cool. The Liquid IV one was that thing you did in Nepal, right? Yeah. So or I'm sure you do more stuff too, but yeah, yeah, that was, that was a really interesting uh, experience. Just that whole team uh, are great people. Brandon Cohen, who's the CEO and founder of Liquid IV, he's really good friends with Jake Casson, who's the founder of Movement. And I can't remember how we got linked up originally. I'm assuming it was probably like friends of friends. We were at like a party or something. We started talking and then Brandon got me in contact with their content person. I started shooting Facebook ads for them. Weirdly enough, and talk about a test shoot, I tell, I tell that story about like how I want to test shoot with people. I just offer that to clients. So I'll be like, hey, like, even though I know my worth and I know I can deliver great product for you, it's like, I still want to be fit. Like, I want to be fair to you because I'm not like, once we do start working together, like, I'll just be blunt. Like, it's not cheap and I want them to feel like they're getting a value add from it. So even with Liquid IV, I did a test shoot with them 
and I just sent them some videos. I was like, hey, here's some videos I shot. I literally shot it in Movement's office. Sorry if you're, sorry, Jake, if you are not listening, but I literally shot it in Movement's office and I was like promoting all this liquid IV stuff and like using all of our lights and stuff. And they loved it, hired me, got me on a monthly retainer, started doing a ton of Facebook ads, and weirdly enough, that test shoot crushed. Like I could never re, I could never redo how well that first test shoot video performed, and I was working with them for like six months doing Facebook ads. And like, yeah, of course, like the other videos did well, but like that first shoot that I did for them, they were like, oh, this guy's gonna just deliver diamonds in the rough every week. And I was like, oh, sorry, I can't recreate that one, but we got other ones in the pipeline. Um, and then after about like a couple of months of working together on Facebook ads, Liquid IV was doing a give back mission where they had already gone to, I believe it was Haiti for an, uh, the devastating earthquake that happened a few years back. And um, there was another earthquake in Nepal that I'm sure a lot of people may or may not know about, but it was like, talk about like already a very poor country being devastated by like a natural disaster that killed thousands of people and left their infrastructure in the rubbles. Like it was really sad. So they were doing a give back mission where uh, they already donate a stick of liquid IV for every product sold. So they wanted to do um, a give back mission where they just set up like a med tent up in like, it was pretty much like the Himalayan mountain region. There's a little town at the base of the Himalayas called Galagao. And we flew into Kathmandu, the whole liquid IV team. It was like five liquid IV team members and myself. We flew into Kathmandu, stayed the night, went to Pokhara, which is another city by there, drove six hours up the mountain to Galaga, which was like, I got the worst altitude sickness that trip. It was so gnarly. What was the elevation? Oh my God. At least, I, I, at least like 9,000, 10,000 feet. I don't know. Someone's probably going to fact check me and go, this guy's an idiot, but it was, it was very high. I don't need to be sick essentially. So yeah. We set up a med tent there. There were people that came and like these people were like six years old and they hadn't seen a doctor like a day in their life. It was in the, it was really crazy to see and gave out products. I was filming the whole thing. And, like, dude, talk about an experience where like you need to be in like 30 places at once and like one person doing video, photo, trying to get BTS, trying to get interviews of the Liquid IV team, talking about an experience that just happened. Like it was really stressful and overwhelming, but like Video turned out great. Uh, it's on their website somewhere. It's like a seven minute mini doc that I shot. Another team that is, I think an investor is one of Brandon's like media friends. He has a team, people that edit, help edit like the main uh, video itself. And then I did a ton of like little one minute segments of the video. So that was a really cool project. And it goes to show too, like I never in a million years would think like, wow, I'm gonna travel around the world from doing like freelance videography work, but like been in Nepal, been a, like different parts of California, been in Miami, like been in cool places with cool people to literally just me and a camera. Even purchasing my first camera, I spent like two thousand dollars. I was like, oh, this is so much money. Like if I didn't buy that camera, I would would have not have made like you know many 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 more dollars than two thousand. So it's kind of crazy to think. Yeah, it's like that's how I always look at like new drones and stuff too. I'm like, yeah. It's an investment. <laughs> yeah. Whatever <laughs> helps you sleep at night. Whatever justifies like, yeah. oh, I can spend another thousand dollars on this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The same way with lenses and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to get to spend a bunch of money. It's an expensive uh, hobby. An expensive it is. expensive hobby. Yeah. But we but compared it. to like, uh, compared to going to school or something, uh, like semester of college is like five grand on the low end. Like, way low end, yeah. Super low end. Depends like, where you go. Way yeah. Low end. Depends where you go, but like, even five grand a semester, like, for five grand, you get a lot of camera gear. And you, you can, can watch teach a lot yourself a lot. I was gonna say, you can go to YouTube Academy and teach yourself a lot. That's the thing, too. And I know there's like some meme or whatever that goes around, but it's like, when I quote people for freelance work, it's like, you're not paying me for my time to do that project, you're paying me for the 500 hours I spent watching Danny's videos and watching YouTube and like learning and like disassembling a Ronin M and reassembling a Ronin M, you know, it's like, you don't see that struggle. You just see like, oh, Robbie knows how to film a video. We're going to hire that guy. Yeah. So same movement. It's like, and it's like, I, I love my job of people I work with get compensated fairly, but it's like, you know, that like everyone in that team is like, everyone carries the hat, like wears the hat of like three people and carries their weight, you know, the freelance world is, uh, it's just kind of what you make it. Like, yeah. There's so much personal responsibility. There's not someone that's telling you to do this or that or the, this other thing. It's like, if you want to make money and you want to go out and do it, like you have to do it. Just do it. 
Yeah, so yesterday on my Instagram, I just put a story out, um, just kind of announcing that I would be sitting down with Robbie, and you guys asked some pretty great questions, as well as some pretty horrible questions. <laughs> um, so we're just going to go over a few of those now. Here's a good one. Um, yeah, so someone asked, how does a videographer slash content creator move to working with bigger brands? This, this kind of relates to my philosophy about life just in general, whether it's videography work or just anything else, talking to a cute girl, like whatever it is, it's already a no unless you ask or unless you try, right? So like with that being, it's, it's as black and white as that. It's, you're not gonna ever work with movement if you don't try and find what my, find, figure out what my email is online somehow or like reach out to my, D, like DM me on Instagram or whatever, right? You're not gonna talk to the cute girl if you're, it's already a no if you don't go up and talk to her and ask for a number and say, hey, can we get coffee? It's already a no if you're not gonna reach out to a brand and say like, hey, here's my pitch deck or anything. And even if you don't have a pitch deck or if you don't have any work to show for it, be honest and transparent and be like, hey, I'm just, I think I'm, I think I got what it takes to potentially have a great relationship in a video, like of you as a brand, as a client, whatever. Um, and be honest and say, this is my first work, like work or my job. Like if I made a movement video, this is my first movement video, whatever. Like, um, so I think what does it take to work with bigger brands? It really just takes asking and putting yourself out there and being in uncomfortable situations where you might get rejected and being okay with being rejected. Because if you're not going to do the bare minimum, which is reaching out and to any capacity, text, email, DM, call, try to find a friend of a friend. If you're really, really desperate and you want to work with someone, like go outside their office and meet someone, not sound like all stalker, but like really, like you have to show that work ethic and tenacity and drive to want to do it. Because if you're not doing it, someone else is doing it. You know what I mean? Like if you're not DMing me to get lunch with me and now we can sit here and be friends and shoot the shit and talk how we are, then someone else is going to DM me to get lunch. You know what I mean? So like people such as yourself or anyone should really be reaching out more and trying to just get your foot in the door. It was the same, same thing with how I even landed my job at Movement. Like I just took a gamble and was like, Hey, I'd love to work with you. Whereas that entire email could have ended at, you know, like, Hey, thanks for the free watch. Like, it was cool meeting you and then like my whole life would be different my whole like i think about it all the time too like my whole world would be a 180 it's wild to think like wouldn't know any of the friends i have wouldn't have gone to half the events or traveled around the world like i had like it's crazy so yeah. yeah it's it's weird thinking back the little tiny decisions that you make in your life that have such a drastic that effect. ripple effect the the other cool thing about it is like in today's world these big brands that like like 15 years ago, if you wanted to reach out to Coca-Cola about doing something, like, how did you do that? Like, yeah. it's Coca-Cola. Like, there was, there's no, no contacts, point. there's no way to get an email, like, there's literally, there's no way that you could do that unless you, like, knew a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend or something. But now it's like, you could probably go to Coca-Cola's Instagram, hit them up, and, I mean, I don't know what you'd want from Coca-Cola, but yeah. it's like, you hit them up, say, hey, I love Coca-Cola, like... Would you want to work together? And maybe that's not the best example, but no, it's a the, great, it's the, a great, it's a great point, great example, everything. Yeah, yeah, like the biggest brands in the world are just like a DM away, and it's really crazy. And I, and I feel like a lot of people can't wrap their mind around that, just the ex, like how accessible everyone is in today's connected world, right? Like to your point, DM movement, I'll see that to, you know, like there used to be a person on my team who has since now left the company, but like. If it's not that person, it's me. If it's not me, it's Emmy. Like, we will see your DM. We'll reach out if we want to reach out, you know? Or, like, if we don't see it the first time, which actually just happened where uh, Cooper Cup, who is one of the wide receivers for the LA Rams, he DM'd us, like, back in November. And do we get 100, 150, 200 DMs a day? Like, I didn't see it. And I genuinely just missed it. Obviously, I would want to meet Cooper if, like, I saw that. I'd be like, oh, cool, man. Huge fan of, the, like, huge fan of the Rams. Like, here's some watches. What do your teammates want? Like, I would have had that, like, relationship then. And I missed his DM and he followed up. Like I just happened to be like on DMs and he followed up and I see it like the notification on the top and goes Cooper Cup. And I recognize the name, tap on the thing. He goes, Hey, just following up. Like, is anyone there? And I'm like, dude, shoot me an email. Like whatever. We start emailing. I was like, shoot me a text, shot me a text, came into the office last week. And now I've like, now I have a great rapport with Cooper. And like, he's like, dude, come to the Rams game. And now it's like fast forward a few months of my life. When season starts, I'll be at the Rams game just because like I answered a DM from Cooper because he followed up. You know, it's like if Cooper can follow up, like you need to follow, you need to like 
reach out to Coca-Cola. If they don't respond, reach out again, reach out again, find their PR agency, reach out to their PR team. You know, like that's just like the name of the game is like, if you're not going to do it, there's a hundred people that will do it. Yeah. That's uh, so cool. That just goes to show like, you're never too good to send another DM. No, Sometimes yeah. I feel like if I, someone doesn't answer me at, at first glance, I'm like, no, I don't want to be that 2DM guy, but it's like, yeah, no, no, they probably just didn't see e- it. Ego aside, <laughs> ego aside, and like, hey, maybe some people are just straight up dicks, and they're like, screw this guy, like, yeah. I, don't, I don't need drone footage, whatever, right? Like, maybe they are just a-holes, but no, most people, like, for your ego aside, most people are happy to communicate. It's just a matter of, like, following up and, like, just putting in the work, yeah. Um, that was a great question. Well. That was a good question. Yeah, good question, Misha. Misha, you're killing Thanks it. Question. Killing it. Another... Fabulous question is someone said, give me likes. <laughs> Tyler? No. <laughs> the currency of our generation. Give me likes. likes. <laughs> Robbie Snader put, who is this guy? He seems like a douche. <laughs> sounds like something I'd write about myself, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Self deprecating uh, humor sounds about right. <laughs> so, this is another good one. Uh, what's been one of the best investments into your career? That's a great question, and I probably have an answer that would be different than what you would expect or what you would, that person would want to hear. I think the best investments are people. And what I mean by that is just, in today's society, it's better to be, and this is true for a lot of workplaces too, like if you're more liked than you are a good employee, chances are you're not gonna lose your job. Like, cause you're a culture fit, company fit, like you're the right person. And you, as long as you're coachable and you're willing to learn and grow, you don't have to be the best employee off the bat, but like be a good person. So I think like best investment into like, whether you wanna be the best videographer or whatever, is like your network of people, because even someone that's out of the entertainment sphere, they know someone or that person that's their best friend knows someone, right? So I think if you have really, really good relationships and you can invest your time, energy, and effort into whether it's doing this with you today and taking an hour out of my day to prioritize this or get coffee with someone who, like, whatever it is, I think the best investment you can do probably for life as well is just, like, invest in people that you know are genuinely good and you want to be around and keep in your circle. Um, That's probably, like, my big, like, Buddha answer the actual reality situations like invest in you can't you know like invest in the equipment that you would also need to get the job done yeah invest in people invest in camera equipment you're confident using just invest in yourself and do good work like learn study up watch YouTube videos uh, I went to film school but I would even say like I've learned I've learned a thousand times more from friends showing me something either if it's editing in like post-production hey do this like this i've learned so much more from friends and being on set and failing than i have in film school like a hundred percent i I would probably watch this back and learn more from just talking to you talking to people that i'm not familiar with and than film school honestly yeah no I, i think that's so applicable applicable Applicable. It's so <laughs> applicable. applicable. Is that, yeah, applicable. 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 Yeah. It's so applicable to not just videography or this side of the world, but yeah, life in general. It's like it goes back to that. It's not about what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. And I really believe in that. And like, like Lucas, for example, who we're mutual friends with. Um, I met met him on a trip like two years ago, and he kind of introduced me to everyone out here like all of his friend group and it's just like from them I met more people then I met more people and more people and more people like if I hadn't met Lucas I probably wouldn't be sitting here with you right now it's crazy and yeah that's just like whatever world you want to be in like just talk to people who are doing it talk to people who are in yeah. that world learn from them and yeah just invest in relationships um, yeah I think yeah I think that's the best the best uh, someone said hmm that's it <laughs> cool story, bro. <laughs> Run it back. Tell me again. Follow for follow? Yes. Are, people, are people still doing that? Follow for follow? <laughs> it must be a thing. Is that a thing? I don't think it's yeah. a thing, so. It's just like, it was very, like, 20, like, 15, 2016. Yeah. This is an interesting question. Uh, specifically for movement, um, does movement movement's direct-to-consumer model change your approach to marketing? Um, I would yeah. say, like, totally. Yeah, great question. Us being a direct-to-consumer 
company primarily definitely has, a, has an effect on how we market and our strategy around campaigns and everything else. For the, yeah, for the longest time, we really just dove into the deep end in terms of like our online store movement.com. We didn't really take a look into like the traditional sales channels of like wholesale, retail, advertising, even on television. Like that wasn't really even a thing in the beginning days. And that was our business model. Our business model, we grew off of like cut out the middleman, go straight to the consumer. Don't have to mark up the watch because you're not buying that Nordstrom's or whatever, right? Um, since then, things have changed. The company has grown. We've scaled to a point where like now Amazon makes sense for us to be on Amazon and we are in wholesale like the Macy's and the Nordstrom's of the world, but we're not also changing those prices. We're just taking less of a profit margin of it because now we've grown and scaled to where we can afford to do that. So being direct to consumer, we primarily run Facebook ads that are direct response, which are all those ones I mentioned earlier that are like, how do we get these people to go to the site? But more important, probably the most important, like out of all the analytics I can look at, the most important percent to look at is what percent is converting. So it's one thing, I'm doing my job well, if I'm getting you to the site and hyping you up and like you see something, whether it's a video on YouTube or on social or an email or a blog, like if you're excited about the brand and you're getting to the site, like I've done my job. Now I'm surrounded by a ton of other really smart people that make the website look incredible. They make it operate smoothly and fast. There's our copywriter who makes the page look amazing and the PDPs to have like the right specs and everything look great. It's a team effort to get people to actually convert to a sale. And then what is the lifetime value of that customer? How do we, maybe they own one watch. How do we get them to come back to buy a watch for their fiance or their brother or their dad or their mom? Or like, how do we get them to come back and buy another watch for themselves? So it's being really scrappy and constantly trying to come up with like new ways to tell the same story, right? We're branching out of different categories, of course, like we started with men's watches, we then did women's watches, then did sunglasses, we branched out of sunglasses into jewelry, and now we have men's rings, women's bracelets, men's bracelets, women's necklaces, like tons of different things within like the fashion accessory categories. I would say we're definitely prioritizing our marketing towards getting people to movement.com and from there in order of importance, it would probably be our wholesale business. So getting people to go to stores and shop because a lot of, a lot of people like they want to buy our sunglasses, but they don't know what it would look like on their face. Mm -hmm. Totally a justifiable thing. I can do everything in my power to make you fall in love with a pair of movement sunglasses. You're like, damn, that was a great ad or whatever it is. But if you're like, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know if I can touch it, feel it, put it on my face. Like I just lost that customer. So then we'll try and market, like we'll shift that focus into like, okay, now how do we also tell the story of like, go to wholesale? How do we also tell the story of like, we're also available on Amazon? You know, like there's so many different things, but at the end of the day, like direct to consumer changes everything about how we market and how we think. Yeah, and even like traditional TV has been like just so new to us. And the first commercial we ran was last year. I was actually on set the day that we filmed the commercial. It was really cool to see. It was a huge production. Uh, and we ran that and it was like a founder story. So it was Jake and Kramer, our two co-founders, just talking about the brand. We played, we literally had like footage of someone holding a phone, going to the website just to make it so like blatantly like this is our brand. You probably saw it online or on Instagram, whatever. And then our version two of that commercial, we went from like a founder's like story that was gonna drive more revenue because it like was more brand centric we shifted gears into like making a lifestyle version, which was our campaign called This Is Movement, which was kind of the baby of like Blake and Jeremiah and Spence and everyone else uh, involved on the marketing side of things. And it was like us hitting every pillar that makes up the brand DNA of movement was like adventure, culture, design, all these cool like fashion, all these cool elements of movement. And we wrote in all these clips from different segments and made it commercial. And without like, telling you too much because there's obviously like NDAs involved, but like it, it still performed really well. It just did so in a different light because it wasn't really an ROI play. It was more of a brand play. And we knew that going into it. So we're here we are like spending a ton of money to promote this commercial that we know might not get people to the site. If anything, it just, and like you were saying how like you see the movement commercial at a bar or whatever, and you're fired up or you like text me and you're like, dude, you just saw the commercial. Like that's, that's what that was. Right. Whereas for direct to consumer, it's so much more of a sales channel. It's like, 
Like it's not, it's never really going to be a brand play. It's going to be buy this, click here, learn more, read about our blog that we just posted, whatever it is. So like get you engaged. It's to get you engaged, but also to convert you into a sale, like into a customer. So yeah. uh, that's pretty much like the underlying foundation of like everything that our strategy is for online marketing is like, how do we get you to the site? But more importantly, how do we get you to convert and buy from us? And how do we get you to come back? That's, yeah, it's that's so interesting because like before social media and Facebook pixels and just ad campaigns, it was like, like you kind of just ran commercials and you don't really know directly how many sales like at all you got from anything. Yeah. But Facebook literally tells you, it's like, okay, you spent $3 to get this $10 sale. Yeah. Or it's like, it's so precise. Really interesting. And, then, and, and like, I could bore everyone to death on like the business side of things. I haven't even really touched on that, but like. It's, it's interesting with TV, we know when a commercial runs because I can check site traffic on Shopify and site traffic just goes, you know, and like, oh, clearly a TV spot just ran during like an NBA game that like everyone's watching and they go to the site, which is cool to see. But outside of that, like you're, like there are ways, but like you're kind of left in the dark to a certain extent on did this person buy, what did they buy, like all these things from the commercial. Cause like you're not plugged in, you're literally watching it on your TV, you're not on the website where we're tracking the data around like what pages are you on, what products are you buying, what's your email, like all that stuff. Um, so it is interesting, like the, the Facebook, dude, Facebook's the scariest company, they literally know all, like they know all about, every, about you, about me, about everyone. Facebook targeting ads is like, you can get as granular as, I'm gonna, sp I'm gonna spend a thousand dollars on this movement ad that's gonna target thirty-two to thirty-seven year old males that have gone to this university that were in this frat that were in this probably not that crazy. I'm being dramatic. Like, it's, it, uh, maybe, dude. It's it's pretty wild. Like definitely like the single mother who makes this income range who like lives in the zip code. Like, dude, it's it's crazy how granular you can get on yeah. digital, and that's also like we we market that way too, knowing that we're like spending money smartly. Like we know we're not just like throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, but like we know that this is a good target ad to do like, uh, if this person spent already $250, we'll hit them with like a rewards program ad. And then I'll make a video about like our rewards program. So when you come back, you can actually reward for spending. Or if this person spent no money, but like we know that they make this much money a year or it's like, they go to this university, like there's so many little things, dude, it's crazy. It's nuts. We're, yeah. we're really like in the last like two months we've been diving into it for Creator Academy. Yeah. Just Facebook ads and it's just like, it's so creepy how much data it has. Like yeah. if someone goes to our website and spends X amount of minutes on the website, we can, you can retarget yeah. them in yeah. the, like in the ad that we'll film, we'll say like, we noticed that you spent like 10 minutes on the website checking it out. So we're just like telling you 10 more reasons that you should go through with it. And it's like, it's creepy. Cause you, like yeah. you talk about something and then a Facebook phone, app shows yeah. up. Like, even, I mean, even with my job, I'm on movement.com so much that any other website I go to, I get all <laughs> movement ads. Cause they just think I'm like the biggest fan of the brand. Yeah. It's like, this guy really shops on our site a lot. Um, or if I add something to cart just to do like a screen recording for like a Instagram story, if I add to cart and forget about it, I'll get an email within like 10 minutes like, sad to see you go, or like, we miss you already. And I'm like, oh, I didn't check out. Like, it was in the car, but I didn't check out. And we was reaching out, like, why did you check out? It's kind of crazy. Yeah. But I mean, literally everyone's doing it. It's the yeah. name of the game. It's not like we're uh, like doing any sorcery, black magic. It's like every brand knows your data and they target ads accordingly. And it's, my role to kind of like know what would be the best content to target you with essentially. Yeah. yeah. And it's not always bad to like for consumers, like you're watching the Super Bowl, there's like a makeup ad or something like you're not going to, you don't care about the makeup ad, Yeah. but I wouldn't get a makeup ad on Facebook. Like I would only get products that I'm somewhat interested in. Yeah, yeah. Like sometimes it gets annoying. You're like, I don't ever want to see this again in my life. But yeah, yeah. other times it's like, oh, sick. Like, I was thinking about buying this. Now yeah, it's like yeah. here. So it's like, it's good for for both parties and also bad because the government knows everything about us. <laughs> everything. 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 <laughs> I mean, there's there's going to be a point where whether it's like Instagram, Instagram having a shopping feature is really smart. I think it's slow to get 
I think it's slow to pick up pace to turning into like an Amazon competitor, but the fact that I can like see a photo of you sitting in your living room and I'm like, like, damn, Danny has a really nice couch. I like the couch where he did it. And maybe you, t- I don't know why, but maybe you tied your couch and I click on it, it goes like West Elm. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy this couch and I can double tap Apple Pay and buy it through Instagram without leaving like the app. That's crazy. I just think it's going to get even more involved where like augmented reality becomes a thing in the future where like you're wearing your augmented reality glasses, you look at your wrist, there's nothing there, but you're seeing it through your, you know what I mean? You're kind of swiping yeah. through what looks good on your wrist and like a 3D render in real time. Like it's going to get wild in the next like 10 years. Yeah. It's just the beginning. It's the beginning of like a whole digital revolution of like smart, really, really smart cater to you advertisements. Like really smart. Yeah. It's creepy. Yeah. It's really <laughs> interesting though, being on the forefront of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just changing so quickly. Yeah. Seeing it first hand is pretty cool though. It's it's cool being in the meetings. Yeah. So I was like, I was like, I go into most meetings and I just kind of like shut the hell up because everyone's so smart and I just want, I want to be a fly on the wall and hear what they have to say. And a lot of it's like talk about the future and what that looks like in all these campaigns. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of the future, what's next for you? Like, what do you, you got any things you're stoked about? Um, big plans? Um, just like going forward? Yeah, I wish I could be like, oh, I'm going to Europe in a month, yeah. Like, no, like, I'm um, kind of grounded right now, just in terms of, like, head down, working a ton. We have some really exciting launches that we're getting, uh, getting out for, like, Q1 this year for movement that I'm really pumped on. Uh, nothing too crazy in terms of travel. I'm gonna just probably just stay here for. I just bought a house, so that's exciting. Like dealing that's with so cool. dealing with all that stuff, and that's already could be its own full time job. Just dealing with all this stuff around that. Um, yeah, man. Movements. Uh, I'm I'm super stoked with my job. Like love my life, love my job, love my friends, coworkers. All that's good. I think like if I were to go anywhere post movement, it would be. A larger, a larger corporation in terms of like probably like an HBO or a Netflix or Amazon Studio, something like that of the world, you know? Um, I'm a big believer in just wanting to constantly challenge myself and if I feel like I hit a ceiling at movement because we are such a small team or I've already been promoted to a role where I feel like someone has to get hit by a bus or something for me to move on, you know what I mean? Like one of those. Yeah. Uh, I would probably leave if it came to that, but I mean, for the foreseeable future, I love, love, love working at Movement. Everyone there is just an absolute first class people to be around on a daily basis and spend 40 hours a week with. Um, so we'll see, man, yeah. I mean, the next journey, I'll hopefully be back to talk to you about when I'm at HBO and we're doing something crazy and that's, my, my campaigns aren't one, vi- one minute videos, but like one month projects on like a movie or something I'm working on, that'd be cool, yeah. So, yeah, we'll see. That's awesome. Well, cool. Thanks for sitting down. Yeah, man. Uh, Thanks for having me. This was yeah, cool. This, this was, was really awesome. Fun. I appreciate it, bro. Thank you guys for checking it out. Um, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Maybe you'll be playing John Danny, Snow. My guy, good day to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, you playing John Snow. But um, yeah, a few Thanks, more crunches man. first. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me, man. Cool. Fun. All right, man. Good well, stuff. Uh, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, dude. Really enjoyed it. I was waiting for you to just like smack me because I'm like, I'm talking too much.